Welcome to Hudley Freeman, uh, author of Life Moves Pretty Fast and various other things. Uh, so very warm welcome to you. Thank you. It seems we're in a room, at least, with uh, people who haven't read the book yet. Uh, so I wonder if you could just start by giving us a, a brief précis of what it's about and why you wrote it. Right. So this book, uh, which I wrote about almost three years ago now, is about 80s movies, which I love very deeply. And it's not just a nostalgia fest, because obviously you can turn on Channel 5 any night and see loads of utterly random talking heads just going, oh yeah, Mannequin, it's amazing. Oh yeah, Back to the Future, it's amazing. Like, obviously, that is, those are all true, although I might actually quibble with the Mannequin <laughs> thing there. But what I wanted to write about is how these movies from 80s movies uh, these movies from the 80s teach us lessons that we don't get today, and that is because actually Hollywood was weirdly very liberal in the 80s, and they were able to do really interesting things with movies that we don't get today. So, for example, depicting abortion on screen in a positive light, or having a black actor take a role that was written for a white actor, um, and all sorts of things like that, depictions of masculinity, um, movies made about and just for women. All those things were coming out of the 80s, and we don't really get those anymore. Okay. So that's sort of why you wrote it. One of the things that strikes me most when reading it is just how much fun it seemed that you were having. <laughs> so much uh, fun. Was that genuinely real, or are you just really skillful at writing as if it were that much fun? Well, there was a lot of angsting beforehand once I had this idea, because my publishers were really not into it. They just thought, nobody buys books about movies, which I quibble with. Almost all my bookshelves are filled with books about movies. And mm, 80s movies, a bit passe now. Does anybody really care about that? And I just knew they did. I knew they did. All my friends love 80s movies. I love 80s movies. And I very much live by the maxim, you should write about what you're interested in, not trying to guess what other people are interested in, which sometimes doesn't always work, probably, readers would say from The Guardian. But <laughs> I believe if someone is passionate about their subject, that really comes through. And so I angsted a lot about, how am I going to do this? And I I thought, how do I sell this to people? Da, da, da. And then I just thought, stop worrying about it. Stop trying to convince your publishers. Just write the book you want to write. Write the book you want to read, which is always what I say to aspiring writers when they ask, you know, how do they find their voice or what, what should they be writing about? I just say, write what you want to read. And I just thought, I'm going to write what I want to read. And it was so much fun. And the more I wrote and the more I spoke to friends about it and the more enthusiastic I saw all my friends were and my parents' friends were and other people getting really into it and saying, oh my god, you've got to talk about, obviously, you know, the 10 best montages and you've got to do, <laughs> you know, the 10 greatest power ballads. Everybody had all these list ideas for me. And obviously, you're going to have to include the Lost Boys and the this and the that. And I thought, oh wow, people really are into this. And then I had then I suddenly got a burst of confidence, and then it was so much fun to write. Yeah. Well, I think we can we can see, even if it weren't for the book, <laughs> by Stranger Things and Ready Player One, there is so much almost pent-up nostalgia for the 80s. Yeah, which and that really wasn't around as much when I was writing it, because I was writing it in 2014. Oh, so you created the I created the, it. The I don't think, I think I'm part of it, which is, I don't mean like I'm anywhere on the same level as Stranger Things, but I am I have this idea that there's a 30-year rule, which is that it takes 30 years for people to look back on a decade with nostalgia. And that's because kids who grew up in that decade are now adults, and they're now making the content, and they're looking back and going, see, that was what was great, and right. they're putting it out there. So I'm very much of that generation that is putting it out there. Cool. So let, let's dive straight into specific films and specific messages that, that you've taken out of them. Um, and I'm going to start with Ghostbusters because I watched it all last night. Um, I was meant Lucky to be you. writing a book and I thought, Blow it, I'm meeting Hadley, I'm going to watch <laughs> Ghostbusters. Blow it indeed. Oh, it's <laughs> awesome. Um, and it, it's aged pretty well. It's amazing. For the I most think. part. Yeah. Um, so you bring out this as uh, almost male role models of friendship. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, as soon as you start talking about the 80s Ghostbusters, you think 2016 Ghostbusters. How would you compare them in terms of uh, does the reboot, whatever you want to call it, of Ghostbusters portray female friendships in the same kind of way, or was it more extreme? I mean, the, the friendships in original Ghostbusters are reasonably extreme and non-normal. You know, non yeah. But there's, there's a certain truth there. There is. And also, obviously, with part of the charm of 80s Ghostbusters is, is it was so based on their real-life friendship, right. um, particularly like Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd, uh, who are friends from Saturday Night Live. And in fact, Dan Aykroyd originally wrote Ghostbusters for him and his best friend, John Belushi, uh, who died at, in the middle of John Belushi literally writing. He wrote a line in the script. He got a phone call saying that John Belushi had overdosed in um, wow. Beverly Hills. Um, so he was writing it for the two of them, and you can sense that 
friendship, and Harold Ramis was a close friend of theirs as well. And I really feel you can have that feeling that these guys all know each other, love each other, and appreciate each other's mm -hmm. weirdness. You know, they all called Bill Murray the Murricane. <laughs> and obviously Harold Ramis then made other movies, and Dad Aykroyd made other movies with Bill Murray. And Harold Ramis obviously then made um, Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. And they had a very complicated friendship. They were all like always falling out with each other. It was a very weird time to be a very successful male comedian in the 80s. But I feel that all comes across, and you sense that despite the weirdness, they all love each other, truly. Um, and now I had so much goodwill towards the 2016 female Ghostbusters. First of all, I love the idea of women carrying a great mm -hmm. franchise. I really love Paul Feig, that he's the one who's championing this idea. He's the one who directed it, and I believe wrote the screenplay for it. I think Melissa McCarthy, Kirsten Wiig, all good things. And it just completely didn't work, which was disappointing. It was a bit like watching Hillary Clinton's <laughs> presidency bid. It was just like you really want it to work, and it just it didn't work. Um, and I think so many of the things that were wrong with it exemplify what's wrong with movies, these kind of big movies today compared to the 80s. I mean, for a start, it was all filmed on studio lot. So the whole city looks really anonymous and generic. You don't really get a sense of where on earth these people are. Whereas in the 80s Ghostbusters, it's very much New York City. Like they are on the New York streets. They're going to Tavern on the Green, this restaurant in Central Park, which is where Rick Moranis has his freak out when he's turned into the ghoul. Um, you see the taxis going around the corners, the piles of garbage. Larry King on TV, mm -hmm. and there's a specificity about that, obviously, New York Public Library, that is very charming, and people then sense that this is real. Like, I this think is it real. helps if you've been to New York. It definitely helps, and if you grew up in New York, as I did. But I feel you're watching this, you're like, okay, this is real. I mean, you know, I watched Ferris Bueller when I was like eight, when I first saw it, and I'd never been to Chicago. I didn't go to Chicago until I was an adult, which is weird, because I only lived in New York. But I liked that they were on the streets, they were mm -hmm. going to the museum, they were going to restaurants. Like, I got a sense of Chicago. It wasn't just some generic studio lot that could be used for a sitcom the next day. Um, and there was no rough edges to the 2016 Ghostbusters. I mean, Bill Murray in the original Ghostbusters is really freaking weird. I mean, yeah, he, yeah. he's like giving electric shocks to this teenage <laughs> boy when it opens. He's leching on everything. He's basically stalking uh, Sigourney Weaver. And the movie accepts all that and isn't excusing it. And in fact, she's making fun of his face to it, whereas I didn't you don't get that as much. It felt more try hard what they were trying to do uh, with the characters there. Um, and I mean, first of all, I really don't, I think it's a mistake to try to reboot such a beloved movie as Ghostbusters. I mean, even Ghostbusters couldn't do it in the 80s when they made Ghostbusters 2 and everyone mm -hmm. got cross about it. Uh, so I don't really know why you would do that. Why not just make your own new movie? Right. Which I guess at the same time we have, uh, if if we're looking for strong women leads, etc., we have Wonder Woman. Yeah, uh, we have which although is an old movie too. I mean, that is piggybacking on another old franchise, which is fair. Yeah. Which is true, which is fair. Um, but people will always have sentimental feelings about old movies. I mean, feel like that is the wrong way to rehash '80s movies. The right way is to do something like Stranger Things, which kind of digests all these '80s movies and makes something totally new through them, without then having people my age and older being like, "Oh, that's because the original," because <laughs> it is original. It's just doing all these amazing homages to Stand By Me and Alien and yep. all this cool stuff. So that, that brings me to TV in general. Mm. Uh, you go in detail in the book into the economics of why films aren't made in the same way, yeah. why things like Dirty Dancing just wouldn't get made now. At all. Um, but it feels to me like interesting things are happening on TV. Definitely. I mean, that is where things are happening now. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I do think you lose something from not having that big go to the cinema moment. I know I sound like I'm sitting in my rocking chair on a porch talking about this. But you know, I remember the weekend Batman came out in 1989 and going to the movie theater with my dad. And it was such a huge deal. I mean, probably you guys all weren't even alive then, but it was such a big deal when this came out. Like this movie had been building up all summer. Mm -hmm. You go to the cinema, there's all this Batman logos, insignia everywhere. And obviously at the time, grown-ups were like, oh, this is disgusting, it's so commercial. But for a kid, this is amazing. And I felt like a really collective experience, sitting in the cinema, watching Tim Burton's Gotham City, you know, seeing Jack Nicholson, you know, it was amazing. And you don't have quite that same feeling watching something on TV. You, you just don't, and you don't, it's not even about, ooh, the glory of the cinema. It's more that everybody's watching things at different times now. And it's, it's a, more of an individual experience rather than a collective experience. I guess, although, I, think about when Handmaid's Tale was on. Yep. There would, I would watch it without being able to breathe barely <laughs> until the adverts, and then suddenly check Twitter. Check Twitter and exactly. see everything. So there's a sort of different It's a different collective, collective experience, collective it is. Experience, you know, yeah. Judd Apatow, um, 
talks very sort of sentimentally, I think in the book I used the quote, where he talks about going to the Ghostbusters when that opened, going to the Ghostbusters movie, and standing in the line around the block. And yes, this does sound like we're all talking about oh, going to drive-ins in the 1950s or something, but there, there is something to be gained from that, and there is something else to be gained from watching things on TV and like tweeting about it with mm -hmm. your friends and seeing what Armando Iannucci is saying about something that you just watched and other people who you like, Sharon Horgan or whoever. Um, but I think there is something sad about the kind of just really kind of slow death of big cinema, really, because that is what yeah. I grew up with. Yeah, I, I think it will be interesting to see what happens to cinema in the next 10, 20 yeah. years yeah. with more and more great stuff coming on TV, basically. Yeah, which they're not even trying to compete with because they're too scared to compete with it, really. So. And occasionally cinemas will show TV series at the cinema. And yeah. it's sort of, this is, this yeah. is a strange, strange situation. Going back to the lessons that we should have been learning, mm. um, it feels you know, the title is "The Lessons We Learned," mm. as if you know, job done. <laughs> we don't need to talk about those things we've we've learned now. I'm pretty sure you'll agree that a lot of those lessons haven't been learned. No, properly. that's right. Is there any one in particular that you think we really need? Is there one of these films that mm. you should say, right, this should be on the curriculum? Everyone should just get the message. I mean, I as a as a woman and feminist, all the rest of it, I mean, I would say Dirty Dancing, really. I do think Dirty Dancing is an amazing movie. And people, um, particularly, not wanting to gender stereotype here, particularly men, tend to laugh at me when I say that. Um, I've yet to meet a man who's ever seen Dirty Dancing willingly and not been forced by his girlfriend you, or you wife. You absolutely have now. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I come to Google. Everything's here. Um, uh, but it is an incredible movie. It's a movie about the importance of legal abortion, um, which is what Eleanor Bergstein, the screenwriter, wrote it to be. She, wa she felt in the 80s that women were taking feminism and um, access to abortion for granted, and that Roe versus Wade was under threat. And so she wanted to write a movie for teenagers that stressed the importance of it. And so she took this movie, set it in, I believe it's the end of the 50s, I can't, it's the 60s, isn't it? No, it must be the 50s, um, where abortion was still illegal in America. And there's a character in the movie who gets pregnant and has to have an illegal abortion and then has to be saved by Jennifer Grey, her character called Baby, Jennifer Grey's dad, who's a doctor. And this is really just like slid into the movie. I mean, obviously when people think of Dirty Dancing, they think of Patrick Swayze holding up yep. Jennifer Grey in the lake and you know the two of them having sex and all the cool songs on the soundtrack. I mean, and that is what you're supposed to see. But she buried this subplot in it and made it so essential to the movie that no one could take it out. Right. And the studio who made it, the producers at first didn't have any problem with it. And then um, a pimple cream wanted to sponsor the movie and they saw it and they were like, oh, we can't have this abortion thing. And Eleanor Bergstein was like, oh, what a shame because the movie kind of hangs on it. It can't really work <laughs> without it. And they're like, oh, okay, fine. And in the end, the movie made so much money that obviously didn't matter that it wasn't sponsored by pimple cream. Um, and the really sad thing is, um, Recently, some Hollywood producers went back to Eleanor and said, we'd love to remake Dirty Dancing, obviously. And they and she was like, great. And they said, but we're going to take out the abortion thing. That's and she said, no way. And what she did instead was she re rewrote it for the stage. And you guys might have seen this in the West End, the Dirty Dancing musical, which she did. And she oomphed up the... Um, the abortion subplot and emphasized about how the doctor really could have gone to prison for helping a woman who'd had an illegal abortion and was dying on a table from internal bleeding and really made it very central in the play. I mean, you, it's, you, you can't ignore it in the play. In, it, in the way in the movie, you can almost overlook it. In the play, you really can't. And that movie has made almost a billion dollars around the world, um, which just emphasizes how cowardly and wrong Hollywood movies are now. I mean, you try to think of a movie that depicts abortion now. Okay, so the obvious one would be Juno, that was mm -hmm. made, came out about 10 years ago now, in which abortion is depicted unbelievably negatively, like so negatively, even though this is a schoolgirl, I think it's like 15 in the movie, who is not in a relationship and needs to do something when she's pregnant. And she goes to the abortion clinic, it's dirty, it's seedy, the woman at the reception desk is like kind of licking this lollipop in a salacious way. Um, and in the end, the character Juno, um, is, uh, who's played by Ellen Page, of course, is persuaded not to have an abortion because an abortion protester tells her outside, you know your baby has fingernails. Now, there are a lot of reasons a woman can have, choose not to have an abortion. I mean, I have two children myself, so obviously there was a period in my life when I chose not to have an abortion. I'm not saying every woman who's pregnant should have an abortion, but you cannot have an abortion protester use a stupid argument like that and on screen show that as that's okay. Like, that's not, that's not okay. Um, particularly since the movie was written by a self-professed feminist, Diablo Cody, and stars one, Ellen Page. And I find it really upsetting that no, but at no point in this 
did they think this is not right to do this? And I know you, you interviewed Ellen Page about that. Did you also interview the, the writer? Diablo. And sort of why, why she chose to write it yeah, that way? Yeah, I did. I, I did interview her and I, I said to her, I don't understand why you depicted abortion so negatively in this movie. You could have just had her say, do you know what, I actually want to have this baby and give it to a couple who don't have a baby. That's right. a perfectly reasonable reason not to have an abortion. Yep. And she said to me, any woman who doesn't think I'm not doing enough for feminism can kiss my butt. And you're like, that is not a response. That right. is not a response. That's sort of whataboutism. Yeah, that's just not a response. That's a stupid response. Um, and then Knocked Up was the other obvious one in which a woman gets pregnant on a one night stand. She's 22, she's just got her dream job being a TV host. and she rejects flat out not having a, not having an abortion, which is fine. Maybe a lot, you know, a lot of women would do that. It seems unlikely in that circumstance that a woman in LA who just got you know, her dream job would reject having an abortion, but fine. And the only character who mentions it to her is her mother. And the mother is styled in the movie as basically horrendous. And the mother says to her, just get it taken care of and one day you'll have a real baby. Now obviously that's a terrible way right. to put it. That's a terrible way. And nobody who is pro-choice as I am would say it like that. Just say, it's your choice, it doesn't matter, you know, it's your life. Do you I'll want to be looking after way, a baby? Or just say, yeah. do you want to have a baby right now? You're 22, you don't even know this guy's name. Like seriously, do you want to have a baby? And she goes, yes I do actually, you know, it feels important to me. And then you say, fine. What you don't say is just just get rid of it, it's disgusting, right. it's not a real baby anyway. That's not the way people talk about abortion. So between Juno we've got uh, a pro-life campaigner who's giving bad reasons and then we have a pro-choice person, person who's, giving bad, who's giving bad reasons. Yeah, I mean, it, there's it feels no, like we need a more mature yeah, representation. Yeah, there's no positive basically. way. And there's only been one movie that's really dealt with it, which was an, a small independent movie called Obvious Child, which came out, I think, in 2016, starring the very excellent Jenny Slate, in which it's about a girl who gets pregnant, well, not a girl, she's 20, it's a woman who gets pregnant after a one-night stand. But the thing is, the whole movie is about her decision whether or not to have an abortion. And they then show her, you know, the camera's over, she's on the gurney, she decides to, and there's like tears rolling down her face. And you think, you know, sure, some women really do feel this very strong way about it. But for a lot of women now, they don't. They don't. And for a lot of, I mean, I had an abortion when I was 24, I'm very happy to talk about it, and it was just a relief. And everybody in here will know somebody, whether they know it or not, who's had mm -hmm. an abortion at this point. It's not, it doesn't have to be depicted as this seismic thing in someone's life. It is just something that happens and you, take, and you deal with it. Whereas in 80s movies, you have something like Fame, which everyone forgets had an abortion in it, in which a girl in the school gets pregnant and she's white and he's black already. You cannot imagine this happening in a movie today. And she just goes to the clinic, it's done, and then she goes back to the school. Fast Times in Ridgemont High, 1980, I believe, Amy Heckerling, written by 18-year-old Cameron Crowe. A 14-year-old played by Jennifer Jason Leigh gets pregnant. She gets taken to the clinic by her older brother, played by the much-loved and much-missed Judge Reinhold. Um, he picks her up afterwards, they go home, she goes back to school. I mean, that these are just making abortion part of life, which is what it is now, rather than making it either a big deal or a terrible deal. And do you think that it was acceptable to do that in the 80s because society was different, because people weren't paying attention to what was going on in the films, or just because Hollywood was bolder? Um, I think, well, two things really. I think people weren't paying as much attention. I think also movies were able to be riskier. The, those movies that I mentioned, Fame, Fast Times, Ridge High, Dirty Dancing, were all made fairly cheaply. They were seen as mid-range movies. So they weren't required to make a billion dollars back right away, which is what movies now are. Movies are now marketed around the world. It costs a billion dollars to market a movie around the world. So every movie that comes out that gets a big release like that has to be basically Transformers or something that doesn't need a lot of translation, that isn't going to upset people in China, which is a massive market market now and isn't going to upset the Christian right in America. So things are much blander, everything specific is taken out, everything real is kind of taken out and that's why movies today feel very bleached. And is that just Hollywood or is it the global film industry? It's mainly Hollywood, it's mainly Hollywood, because it's mainly Hollywood movies that get to go around the world. I mean, you know, the right. French film industry doesn't spend a billion dollars setting movies around the world generally. Um, but also, Hollywood underestimates things a lot of the time. So Hollywood is now, when in the 80s, a movie made 80% of its money in America, 20% overseas, and now that's flipped around. Um, and in some ways, you could say that's good, that Hollywood is aware that the rest of the world exists, but it does mean that they have these weird assumptions about what people in China like to watch. Um, and so they'll say, well, you know, in China we can't have, you know, they're not gonna go see a movie with a female lead, or they're not gonna have a movie with a woman on the poster, and there are loads of examples online. You can look at it through a website called Google, um, of which movies that had female women, uh, female women, had, <laughs> had female actors or women on the posters in America and Britain that have men on the poster 
in China. You know, they do this also with black and white actors. So like right. 12 Years a Slave, for example, had Brad Pitt on the poster when it went overseas. I mean, it's like there's a lot of that. But actually, if you look at the Chinese film industry, a lot of their movies do have female leads. They do take much riskier things. It's just that America is just like, whoa, we can't annoy the Chinese. We have to be really careful with this. So is Black Panther out in China yet? <laughs> and what are they doing with It'd it? It'd be really interesting to know what happens with Black Panther because actually the last movie that made a lot of money overseas that had an all-black cast was Coming to America in 1989. Uh, it'd be amazing if Black Panther can kind of restart that again 30 years later. So I, I wasn't sure whether we should discuss this as two white people talking about racism is never a great look, but just briefly, <laughs> uh, in the book you talk about um, Spike Lee and Eddie Murphy having very different ways of empowering African Americans and mm. you know, different ideologies about it, almost. Um, whether you make films that are about black communities or you have black people in white communities, you know, like Eddie Murphy in several films may be the only black actor. Yeah. Um, and it struck me, thinking through that argument, um, how Hamilton has kind of done something interesting to take a third position yeah, right. there. Yeah. Um, do you think that's something that works to compromise on those two positions? Or is it just, it, would either Spike Lee or Eddie Murphy be happy with what's happened there? Or do you think they, they still have an issue around I don't think Eddie Murphy's that happy about anything these days, <laughs> which kind of breaks my heart, because he really is my favorite of all the 80s actors. Um, but I think Spike Lee would kind of love it, surely, Hamilton. I mean, I hope most of you have seen Hamilton. It is amazing as you watch it. When you first see it, you're just like, whoa, Thomas Jefferson is a black guy. And then you're like, you literally don't even see it at, like within five seconds. It's amazing. Um, in fact, I say it almost goes in reverse. So um, in fact, I bought this copy of the book on my way to see Hamilton in mm, December. Mm. And then uh, in February, I went to Hamilton Grange in New York and saw various pictures of Hamilton and Jefferson <laughs> and all these people. And I thought, well, they're white. Yeah, they're all <laughs> like, white. It That's was so really weird. weird. They're all yeah. white. <laughs> yeah. Um, so That's true. That's true. And you suddenly think back on other plays and movies you've seen, you're like, that's so weird. Everyone was white in them. Like that's such a, right. a we or that's such a weird casting decision. Anyway, anyway. Um, so yeah. So Eddie Murphy's whole thing was he was going to infiltrate the mainstream Hollywood industry in a way that no black actor had been able to before, and Richard Pryor had been too self-destructive to do so before. Mm. Um, and then make movies from within and kind of recreate the system from within, which he successfully, incredibly successfully did. And you know, it, it's a testament to his talent that he did that because a black actor famously needs to be like ten times more talented than a white actor to. Get a role, and he was a million times more talented than everyone, and he was the most successful actor of the decade. Whereas Spike Lee was all about giving a voice to the black community and mm -hmm. what the black community was going through at the time, so making things like She's Gotta Have It and those kind of movies. And they were absolutely polar opposites. And Eddie Murphy, as the decade went on, got increasingly attacked for this by the black by the black community, feeling like they that he'd abandoned them, that he was making you know Beverly Hills Cop and The Golden Child, in which he's basically the only black guy in it, and making movies for white audiences and not reflecting right. the black experience. And he became more and more kind of embittered and kind of drew more and more into himself. And then he made Coming to America, which is an incredible movie in that it has an entirely black cast and no white audiences seem to notice that in America. And if any of you know anything about racial history in America, that really is kind of a miracle. Um, and then after that, he, he, start, he started doing more of that. So like Boomerang he did in the 90s in which he sort of gave, you know, launched Chris Rock. Um, but he became angrier and kind of sadder. And you know, anyone who has the kind of success that he did so quickly, you know, it's going to screw up your brain. Um, and Spike Lee, I mean, he, I think Spike Lee is just incredible. I mean, you know, his movies from the 80s and 90s are some of my favorite. But he found himself being painted into this tiny corner that he couldn't really break out of. But if you look at the early 90s, there were so many amazing movies about African Americans, particularly people like John Singleton and Boys in the Hood and stuff like that, that. Uh, you don't see any more today. And I personally believe that it was the combination of Eddie Murphy and Spike Lee together that kind of helped that era right. of the 90s, 90s movies of African American cinema. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Let's uh, take away from politics entirely for just briefly. Um, one of the things I love that you say is that The Princess Bride, which was one of my favorite films <laughs> ever, uh, works brilliantly because it is, it is a fairy tale and it's a spoof of a fairy tale. Yeah, that's right. Um, much like Into the Woods yeah, is yes, a spoof right. of fairy tale as a musical yeah. and an absolutely awesome musical. Um, various films have tried to do this, and some succeed and some 
really don't. So for me, ones that succeed, The Frighteners mm -hmm. is a great uh, sort of horror film and spoof horror film. Um, and Starship Troopers yeah, manages to work very in various different ways. Uh, I remember I was at university when Starship Troopers came out and I was in the fourth year and had various friends in the first year and Titanic was out at roughly the same time. <laughs> and all of my first year friends said, oh, I love Titanic, it's so deep, no pun intended. But Starship Troopers is just mindless violence. And all my fourth year friends were going, wow, Starship Troopers is very, very cunning. <laughs> Titanic is extremely dreary. Yes, and, yes, uh, that so is true. It worked for me and then you've got films like Scary Movie which are very explicitly trying to be a spoof. Yeah. And again, for me, it doesn't work. No. What do you think is the key to, to getting that balance? I feel that the filmmaker has to really love the genre. I mean, another one I would add into that that's quite like that is Mars Attacks. And I know people kind of have mixed feelings about Mars Attacks. I am a big Tim Burton fan, as you might have guessed at this point. <laughs> and I feel like you, you get that he really loves that genre of that kind of schlocky alien movie, obviously, like Ed Wood whole thing. Like, yep. he loves, you know, Return from Planet Nine. And, he's kind of, and he is sending that up, but also doing it. Um, and with The Princess Bride, William Goldman, who wrote the original book, which I highly recommend if any of you haven't read it, it's so amazing obviously knew those books from reading them to his daughters at night. I mean, he said he wrote The Princess Bride because his daughters loved princesses and brides, and they loved books about them, and he just combined the two. And he knows those stories, and he also knows those kind of pretentious um, academic approaches to them, which is what he makes fun of in the book. Uh, a little bit like Possession by A.S. Byatt as well, like kind of making fun of this kind of academic attitude towards literature, which is what he does. You have to love the genre. You can't hate it. And I feel like the scary movie genre, the scary movie movies, does that make sense? Um, they're just kind of, they're sort of hating on it. They're just making fun of it. And you have to have love for it. And I feel like, and I don't mean to keep mentioning this TV show, with Stranger Things, you feel the love. Right. It's oh, not absolutely. just like making fun of 80s, 80s hairstyles and 80s music. Like normal homages to 80s stuff just take the silly surface. You have to have a deeper feeling. And with Princess Bride, you get the deeper feeling. It's not just like, oh, princesses screaming in a tower and dragons. No, it's like there is like deeper emotions going on. Fantastic. Yes. Back to the politics side. Uh, so I, I was thrilled. Uh, you know, I started reading the book thinking, hey, this is a book about movies. And then thought, hey, it's another feminist book. Hooray. <laughs> so, I mean, just finished a bunch of feminist books. I, thought, I, I read life moves pretty fast. It's another. Yay. Um, and you have the Magnolia Test. Mm -hmm. uh, before I go further, do you want to describe the Magnolia Test? Oh, my <laughs> gosh. No, you no, you describe the Magnolia Test, actually. You'll do it better than me if you read oh, the Oh, it's so long <laughs> since I wrote the question, but it's it's about a strong uh, women-led film yeah. uh, that depicts women, uh, depicts women doing awesome things and tends to have, and this is the bit that I want to talk about, um, men who are really not much, <laughs> we'll say. Uh, uh, Either they're explicitly despicable or they're just a bit useless. Yes. Um, do you have any good examples for <laughs> allies and just men who want to be decent human beings? Oh, for sure. Of for sure. strong women-led films that depict men not in a romantic role, mm. but being decent human beings? Um, yes, yeah, so obviously the Magnolia Test is, as I'm sure you've all guessed, named for Steel Magnolias, which is my favorite women's movie of all time. And any man who's like, oh, I don't want to see a movie about loads of old women, you're so wrong. It's like one of the funniest movies it's ever. It's one of these that I haven't seen yet. I, I mean, no, again, like Dirty Dancing, no man has ever willingly watched Steel Magnolias. It was written by a man, I should add, and is a true story about his sister. But anyway, it's, that's a whole other issue. Um, my favorite movie that depicts platonic male-female friendship is Say Anything. Um, I'm amazed by how few people in this country have seen it. In America, it's like such a major teen movie. It's you know up there with Dirty Dancing or whatever, or you know Breakfast Club. Um, Say Anything is so great. So it's I, how many have, have, have many of you seen it? Most of you probably yeah. haven't. Just a few. Oh my God! All <laughs> of you guys need to go home. Not just guys, like guys, girls, everyone. Just go home, watch it right now. I excuse you from work for the day. So <laughs> it's, it's about John Cusack in oh, his. Oh, it's John Cusack as well. Uh, uh, you, do you not know? Oh my God! No, got, oh my God! It's John Cusack at his most John Cusacky. It's his <laughs> ultimate role. Like forget about Gross Point Blank and Grifters. It's like the ultimate Cusack role. Um, who's in love with the? He's like the sort of weird kid in high school, wears a trench coat and stuff, um, and he's in love with Ione Skye, who's like the class princess, who's very beautiful. And her father is played by John Mahoney, the recently deceased father of Frasier, as you all probably better know him as, who is wonderful in it. But anyway, so it's about him, John Cusack trying to get with Ione Skye. 
But in the background, he's got his two best female friends called DC and Corey, one of whom is played by the immense Lily Taylor, who is amazing. And you're watching this movie, and you, the opening scene is them talking. And like the three of them obviously have an incredibly close friendship. They're very similar. They totally get each other. They get each other's music. They like go shopping for guitars together and everything. And you're watching this movie and thinking, if you know, surely he's just going to get with one of them in the end. He's going to forget about this princess. But no. No, like they just want him to be happy and he just loves hanging out with them because as the movie shows, his male friends at school, one of whom is played by Jeremy Piven, um, are just total idiots. Um, played by Jeremy Piven, let's just reiterate that. <laughs> uh, who are just total jerks and he gets his most fun with his female friends and it's a wonderful depiction of male-female friendship and I went to a co-ed school for sixth form and I was like yeah that is what it was like not all men and women who get on then have to sleep together right that's a very nice message to get from a movie yeah <laughs> absolutely and it's sort of almost the anti-message of when Harry met Sally I know was, I know <laughs> although and that I do feel like I mean they, it's not really but it is true it is the anti-message of that but there is also the cross friendships there you know with Bruno Kirby and Carrie Carrie Fisher like they are all hanging out and they're not all sleeping with each other. It's right. like some mass orgy. <laughs> and anything that has Carrie Fisher just gets my vote immediately. Exactly, so. exactly. Oh, again. Oh, oh. Yeah, so sad. <laughs> um, okay, it feels like, I, I have no idea what the time is, but it feels like we've been chatting away. Sorry, uh, I talk with, so much. No, 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 <laughs> quite, quite the reverse. It's, it's <laughs> extremely uh, needy for me. Uh, other people may have questions, <laughs> and I'll just interject more. Uh, first, I wanted to add a comment. You said that one day TV shows will be shown in cinema. Uh, they are shown in the cinema. For example, Game of Thrones was shown in the cinema. Right. Of course, like it must be a spectacle. But about politics and all that stuff, what is your how to say? How do you think? What do you think about forcing? diversity in cinema. What, what do you think about scandal in Academy Awards, about not enough black actors and all that? What do you think about it? So what is your say, thoughts? I mean, I write about it quite a lot, because until The Guardian stopped being able to send me to LA for the Oscars, very sad. I used to go to the Oscars every year to write about it. And of course, it's, you know, I think it's good for it to be drawn to attention. It's not like I think there should be quotas, but I do feel like the Academy should be shamed into the fact that, you know, there are so few black winners of Academy Awards. It is amazing. So few women directors have been nominated or won awards. It's, it's, it's mortifying. Um, and this should be drawn to attention. And the problem is, is that the Academy is very largely old white men. You know, there are many statistics about it. And they just see themselves. You know, they look for themselves. OK, but uh, what about just the less black actors in how to say, work in... No, it's never, I mean, it's never going to be 50-50, but there obviously should be more. I mean, there, have been, there are plenty of incidences of African-American actors just being completely overlooked. I mean, Eddie Murphy, how has Eddie Murphy not won an Oscar? I mean, he clearly should have won an Oscar at this point. Everybody and thought uh, this, the same thing about DiCaprio until... About <laughs> about DiCaprio, one yeah. Time. Well, <laughs> well, he did win his Oscar, though. I mean, he he got there. Um, and I, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I genuinely believe Eddie Murphy is like one of the greatest actors around. I mean, he got nominated for Dreamgirls. I personally would have nominated him for Bowfinger, which he is incredible in. And all of you need to see that too. It's not an '80s movie. It's a '90s movie. Him and Steve Martin. I mean, Eddie Murphy's performance in that is just like astonishing. Um, and as he said, I mean, if you, you can Google Eddie Murphy, <laughs> you can Google Eddie Murphy um, speech at the Academy Awards. It's so hard not to do that. Um, in which he talked about this in the 80s, saying, well, you guys gave an award to a black actor last year. I can't remember who it was, maybe Denzel Washington. So you don't need to do it for another 30 years, right? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that is literally how it works. That is literally how, you know, how, why, you know, Greta Gerwig, why is she not overlooked, you know, for best director? You know, it's stuff like that. You just think this is ridiculous that it's these old white male movies that win all the time. Thank you. Hi. Um, do you think uh, Netflix and Amazon getting into kind of film production is going to kind of revive this kind of 80s tradition of being a bit edgier? And no question. I hope so. I mean, the film festivals are really freaked out by it, as far as I can tell. A lot of them refuse to show Netflix and Amazon Prime <laughs> productions, which is just ridiculous. You can't fight against 
what is happening. I don't know how Netflix and Amazon Prime have so much money. Probably you guys in this room can uh, enlighten me on that. <laughs> uh, but they are making really amazing stuff now. I mean, the conversation I hear with my friends, what used to be like, what are you going to go to, are you going to see something in the cinema this weekend? It's now, have you seen that new Netflix documentary? I mean, that is how people talk to each other. That's how, you know, I've got two very young children, so I'm at home most evenings. And my boyfriend and I, all we do now is watch stuff on Netflix and Amazon Prime and stuff that they've made, original content. I, we're currently watching The Defiant Ones, which is amazing, which is the documentary about Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre. I should have been keeping a list. It's, 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 you know, this is the stuff we watch now. It's not, it's not going to the multiplex on Friday night anymore. It's, the world has changed. But one interesting thing uh, to come back to films, uh, I was thinking about films that I have found not necessarily edgy, but uh, have at least promoted a more diverse worldview um, and engaging young people politically, I think, mm. tend to be around either superhero or superhero-like. If you think, you know, mm. even if you didn't like no, Ghostbusters, it's, true. No, it's, it's true. sort it's of true. The, the remake of Ghostbusters, you can think it's kind of superhero-ish. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, um, no question. And by the time we've got um, Wonder Woman and Black Panther, and at the same time, young people certainly in America, and I, I think over in the UK as well, to, to a slightly lesser extent, appear to be more politically aware. Yes, no question. Is there a correlation, causation? I mean, maybe. I mean, it's certainly true that superhero movies have been good at smuggling in good right. roles for women and ethnic minorities. They have they have been good at that. You know, and Ghostbusters, one of the specific things was to, you know, improve the representation of, you know, this is a terrible way of putting it, the black Ghostbuster. I mean, one of the big faults with the original Ghostbusters, how Ernie Hudson is so sidelined in it, like for right. no reason, either have a minute or don't. Um, and in, uh, oh God, Leslie, um, what is her name, who plays her in uh, the new Ghostbusters? I forgot my mind's just gone blank. Can someone yeah. Google it for me? Anyway, uh, <laughs> but she has a real role in it, and she's in it the whole movie, and she's not pushed out. Um, and that is great. That was great. And definitely young people. I don't know if young. I don't know if it's because of superhero movies that young people are more enlightened. I think young people always need to go further than the generation before, and young people are going further in this than, than we did. Right. And another thing I find interesting about superhero films, you, you talked about Batman, uh, as sort of, even though it was kind of dark in a way, it had huge light moments. Which, Tim Burton or? Um, uh, the Tim Burton, the yeah. The Tim Burton one, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, big gothic feeling, mm. but still hugely funny bits. Yeah. Uh, and when you wrote the book, was before, I think before Deadpool. Yes, it was, uh, yeah. Definitely before Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, that's right. Um, do you feel that things are taking an upswing? There? I think so, and it's weird. Like I've seen actors like Chris Pratt or whoever get more in these kind of roles, and they are funny yeah. rather than you know tortured you know Christian Bale and tortured Tom Hardy with the mask on his face. I mean, I don't. I honestly like. Do you guys all like those movies? The I modern love them, Batman? but I didn't laugh at them. Whereas we recently oh rewatched Ragnarok, and it's it's, it's very funny. It's very funny. No, it's true. I mean, I loved um, the. The, moder the Christian Bale um, Batman with the Joker. I mean, that is a great role, obviously, with yeah. Heath Ledger as the Joker. But it's not a fun watch. I mean, it's quite heavy weather, really, yeah. watching it. And everything's so dark. I mean, not just like like mood. I mean, the lighting, you can't freaking see anything. Yeah. Whereas you watch <laughs> Tim Burton, I mean, it's so much fun. And, you know, watching <laughs> watching Jack Nicholson do his little dance down the steps towards Kim Bassinger, he's playing Prince on his boombox. Yeah so much fun and it, it looks like a cartoon. It doesn't look like it's taking itself so damn seriously and it doesn't have the constant car chases like you have with the Christian Bale ones. And the Christian Bale Batmans, I don't mean to keep knocking them. <laughs> obviously they're beautiful and they're kind of done in this amazing way. Christopher Nolan is obviously an incredible filmmaker but there's just too much. There's, there's just too much. I feel there's too many characters, too many people being tortured, emotionally tortured. You know, you have Gary Oldman, you have Christian Bale, you have whoever the villain is, you have this and the that. And this. I, the it's like, more so, I think. Yeah. So by the time you get to Dark Knight Rises, oh my it's God. really it's so, it's so all much. on for a very long time. It's so long and like yeah. Avengers, there's just too much. They like pack in so much in these movies. Whereas I feel like with Tim Burton's, you know, Batman, you have just nice, clean, Michael Keaton a bit unhappy in a castle, <laughs> some villain, yeah, it, the there, end. There is the angst. <laughs> yeah, there, oh, there's angst. There's angst. But angst in a quite interesting self-mocking way like yeah. you know kind of he knows he's this you know pathetic rich boy like feel sorry for me rich boy uh, whereas Christian Bale is just kind of like miserable and you're like <laughs> this is great night out <laughs> do we have a, any other questions so I can be slightly less self-indulgent <laughs> um, 
I used to work in children's publishing mm. and I went once to a Marvel showcase and I was really excited because I'm a big Marvel fan and um, I remember being incredibly disappointed because they had this huge cinema screen and they were showing all their new films and then it came up in massive letters, everything we do is to, and I was just really excited for it and it said to sell more product oh. and I remember just Whoa, thinking, yay. is that what's <laughs> happening to cinema today that they want to basically make everything sort of PG-12 so they can appeal to as many people as yeah. possible. And that's why I think films like Batman don't work anymore because they're, they're darker and they're older and everything feels like a little bit safer. And we don't have many 18s anymore. I remember when I used to go to the cinema, I used to sneak into 18s yeah. all the time. And it's now like, there's no 18s. Everything's really dry. Um, and everything's trying to sort of sell more product and merchandise. And, and, and I wondered if you shared that. I mean, definitely everything's trying to sell merchandise, but I, you know, I, you have to kind of blame 80s movies for that. I mean, it was the 80s movies that really got onto that. Obviously Star Wars in the 70s and then Batman in the 80s and Ghostbusters. But I don't feel like they were just made for that. They weren't seen as vehicles for that. It was the merchandise came off the greatness of the movies. And actually the merchandise kind of took those movies by surprise, I feel. Um, Whereas now the movie is almost a sideshow to everything around it. You know, there's just not as much effort put into scripts anymore is for me the real problem between movies today and movies from the 80s. And that's because so much of a movie's takings comes from overseas that they don't want to have movies that have complicated scripts that need um, a lot of translation where things have cultural references that won't translate overseas. Um, which is why it's movies now, like for example, so the Christopher Nolan Batmans are so full of car chases and shoot shootouts and special effects, because obviously you don't need to translate those. I mean, whereas you have something like, uh, you know, going back to Tim Burton's Batman, there's a lot of dialogue going on in those movies, whether it's like in the newspaper office or whether, you know, it's uh, Bruce talking, you know, having the long conversations with his butler and these kind of weird parties that he had. There's like emotional stuff that needs translating and it's just too much of a faff. And like, why bother? You know, big CGI effects. Um, work well anywhere, although I personally find them incredibly tedious. One of the things I love about Ghostbusters is how charming the special effects are. Yeah. They're so shonky. Uh, and now when you see, when I see special effects in a movie, I went to see the, re the modern Jungle Book, I'm watching the actors thinking, I know you're just standing against a blue screen. Like, that's all that's happening here. You feel no real connection between what's going on, the actor and the special effects, I don't think. Um, and I think that's something that's been lost, but that's what translates overseas. I have a question. Uh, do you also have lessons that we shouldn't have learned from 80s movies? Oh my goodness, of course. So obviously 80s movies, for all I'm talking about, Eddie Murphy, et cetera, et cetera, were completely, totally racist, uh, which is why it's amazing that Eddie Murphy was such a success, which is why another reason why everyone should just, you know, worship his talent. Um, if you look at, I mean, let's see, it's the worst 80s racist movies, I mean, where to even begin? Obviously, there's 16 Candles, uh, which is John Hughes's first film with Molly Ringwald, um, who's upset because her parents have forgotten her 16th birthday. What an innocent, sweet movie, you might think. Ah, but let me tell you about their random Asian exchange student called Long Duck Dong, who um, just wants to have <coughs> sex with a white girl and does things like fall out of trees at inopportune moments. Um, there's also this unbelievably weird bit in Sixteen Candles um, where the boy who, um, who Molly Ringwald's in love with um, is talking about how his girlfriend has passed out at a party and he could have quote unquote had her five times without her noticing and then tells the school nerd who's played by um, Anthony Michael Hall, um, why don't you just go out in the car and have sex with her? And it doesn't say it in those words, it goes, why don't you go upstairs? And he does. And then the girl wakes up next to this dorky guy and she's like, did, did we have sex? And he goes, uh-huh. And she's like, oh, hi. Like, it's the most weird thing in the world. And 80s movies are full of that kind of stuff. I mean, those kind of movies don't get, <laughs> they haven't lasted so well. Things like Porky's. Um, Risky Business is something that everyone remembers very fondly as like this movie in which Tom Cruise danced in his underpants. But actually, if you watch it, it's a movie about how a boy who turns, becomes a pimp um, and that becomes a pimp and then gets into Princeton because of it. Because the Princeton guy comes to his house to meet Tom Cruise, who is now fully a pimp, and probably sleeps with the hookers that he keeps in his house and then gets him into Princeton. It's the weirdest movie you'll ever see in your life, I swear to God. Um, so there's all that, obviously. And also, you know, racism against black people is so obvious in 80s movies. I mean, Eddie Murphy's first film is 48 Hours, uh, in which he's opposite Nick Nolte. And Eddie Murphy plays this con who's let out of prison to help grizzled cop Nick Nolte find criminal ring, if I remember this correctly. And it was actually supposed to be Richard Pryor who was, in the who was supposed to be in the movie, but he was 
too much of a disaster, so they cast Eddie instead. Now, Nick Nolte is playing the traditional grizzled cop. Um, you know, a bit alcoholic, has woman problems, rah, rah, rah. and as part of his charming grizzledness, he is incredibly racist. And he calls um, Eddie Murphy things like watermelon, a spear chucker, like unbelievably racist terms. And at no point is this seen as like, oh, maybe we shouldn't like this guy. It's seen as part of his charming, unreformed grizzledness. And Eddie Murphy was asked about this in a couple of interviews, like, was this not a bit weird for you to be doing? And he's like, well, you know, because my character is kind of equal with him, it's like, it makes it okay. And you're like, no, what makes it okay is that Eddie Murphy is such a charismatic actor that it doesn't, he doesn't feel totally subjugated by it. He's able to like, he's out acts Nick Nolte and steals all the scenes. But when you watch it, you're like, this is disgusting, and why am I supposed to be cheering on this grizzled old racist cop who's being totally racist? Um, so there's obviously tons of that. Um, and also, when you look at Eddie Murphy's movies, I mean, I don't, I'm sorry to be going on about Murphy. <laughs> it does happen. Um, he, was, he was not allowed to do very much within them, really. He, I mean, even when he was making them. So you look at Beverly Hills Cop, for example, <laughs> which was a movie that was written for a white actor. And incredibly, it was supposed to be Mickey Rourke who was in it. And then it was supposed to be Sylvester Stallone. Oh. <laughs> and then to Don Simpson um, and um, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, is enormous credit, who were who producers, they did something that had never been done before, which is they decided to cast a black actor in a white character's role, and they cast Eddie. Yet when you're watching this, it's very notable that Eddie Murphy is not allowed to have sex, really, at any point in this movie. There, he has this white female friend in Beverly Hills who works in the art gallery. I'm sure all of you have seen Beverly Hills Cop. You know, the girl who works in the art gallery, with it, she's got that you know, assistant with the funny accent, uh, Bronson Pinchot. And there are lots of scenes where this girl's like sprawling on his bed in the hotel room. They're like hanging out in hotel rooms. They're like old friends. And clearly, in the original script, they were getting it on. But no way is this happening in the movie. No way do you see Eddie Murphy ever kissing a white woman in these movies. Um, so you, you can sense the restrictions that were on black actors, definitely. And this is Eddie Murphy, who was the most powerful actor in, in the 80s. So stuff like that. And of course, the Ernie Hudson thing in Ghostbusters is totally weird and unacceptable. And I say that as someone who loves Ghostbusters almost more than life itself. Yeah, I, I remember watching various films with, uh, with my kids. So we have kids who are 14, 11, and 11. Um, it's like, this is a great film. Ignore that bit. Ignore Just that bit. Yeah. Ignore how they're treating women. That That's not bit. how you treat women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ignore that really unfortunate bit. But apart bit. from that, it's lovely. <laughs> it's funny. John Hughes made quite a few weirdly racist movies in his kind of slapstick thing. Because he, he came from a real sort of slapstick uh, sort of tradition. So his movies, like the National Lampoon Vacation movies, which he wrote, um, are so bizarrely racist. So there's this one scene, I think it is in the first one, National Lampoon Vacation, Chevy Chase um, is driving his kids through the inner city, <laughs> which, you know, he lives in the suburbs, he's driving his kids through the inner city, which obviously means a street full of black people. And their car stops at a light, I think, at this point, and loads of black people just swarm in and start stealing their hubcaps. And in all of Hughes's movies, I love Hughes. You know, Ferris Bueller is literally my favorite movie of all time. The the representation of black people is makes you just kind of want to throw up on your shoes. Um, like Weird Science, for example. I don't know how many of you have seen Weird Science. That's mm. also a terrible movie in lots of ways. I mean, that's kind of the only other time you see black people in a John Hughes movie. I'm trying to think of any others. And it's when Anthony Michael Hall goes to a jazz club, and there are loads of like jazz black people, all being kind of creepy and jazz. And like, that's it. So in John Hughes's world, black people are either stealing your hubcaps or basically smoking reefer and being a bit creepy. Um, so yeah, lots of bad stuff, but also lots of good stuff. <laughs> so I'll ask another question related to kids. You mentioned you have a couple of young children. Have you given much thought to what their introduction to oh your God, favorite 80s movies is gonna be? To... It's all I think about. It's really <laughs> tragic. So um, I have um, two-year-old twins. Um, so they don't really have attention span for anything beyond a two minute Peppa Pig video at the moment. But so they're twin boys as well, which is obviously slightly different for me. Although I, you know, I very much think that boys and girls should just watch the same movies. There shouldn't be these kind of limits, but I do get that certain things grab boys' attention quicker than maybe grab girls' attention. So for example, my first movie from that year that I saw was, I believe, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Whereas I already know, from talking to my boyfriend stuff, like the first movie, 80s movie they're probably gonna see is gonna be like Back to the Future or Indiana Jones. Like those kind of more action-y things. Um, whereas I got, I got to those a little bit later, and obviously I love them, there was no difference. There shouldn't be a difference in both. Boys and girls watch, let me just stress that. But I do think they'll probably enjoy Back to the Future earlier than they might enjoy Ferris Bueller and The Breakfast Club. 
So important question about introducing kids to films, Star Wars. Do you start with episode four or do you start with episode one? <laughs> I get so confused with the episode numbers at this point. It's kind of, um, I think you've got to start with episode four, right? I mean, Thank actually, you. my first Star Wars was stay. Return of the Jedi. Exactly. I think that might have been the first movie I saw in a cinema was Return of the Jedi. Jinx. Yeah. Oh, yeah, really? It's funny. And I loved it because I love the Ewoks, obviously. Right. So I was well down with that. And they changed the Ewok music for the re-release. I it know. Was just it's just horrendous. It's very weird it's when just, they do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for def I, I make I make lists all the time about 80s movies. I'm gonna I've already got like a stockpile of DVDs of what the kids are gonna watch. Um, so yeah, so Back to the Future, Indiana Jones, very much so. Um, Ferris Bueller, which I believe they will truly love at some point, um, and so on and so forth like that. <laughs> E.T. obviously, E.T. might be the first one even. <laughs> Joe, I think my, my kids got a bit bored by E.T., but love Ferris Bueller, love Back to the Future. You know, I was scared by E.T. when I saw I think I saw it when I was about seven, and I just thought he was disgusting. And I was like, why is this weird kind of tree trunk living in this little girl's closet? It's horrible. So, I don't but know. But watch Drew Barrymore, so. I know, I know. Can we talk about Ferris Bueller a bit more? Please. Uh, so, you talk about how uh, it's an interesting depiction. For one thing, I love your take on it as a sort of fantasy, which suddenly explains things, and it's one of those, yeah, why didn't I think of that? Mm. <laughs> um, but it talks a lot about class. Yes. And yeah. I find the whole uh, class and wealth divides in films interesting, particularly because it seems to be an international difference as well. Mm. And yeah. I see it almost more in soap operas, actually. So mm. in the US, there's Dallas and Dynasty. Yeah, right. In Australia, there's sort of middle class, home and away, and neighbors. I mean, I mean one of them in home and away, I remember when I moved here, it was like, they ran a trailer park. Like, I can't remember what their names were in home and away. They, but they literally ran, or like here, EastEnders. Well, exactly. I so couldn't believe down, the differences. You know, middle class. Yeah, upper middle class yeah. in, in, Australia's, in Australia, and then we have EastEnders and Coronation Street. And if you look at a lot of the UK film industry output, mm -hmm. things like Brass Off, Billy Elliot, yes. tends to be more working class um, and will focus on the class divide more. Yep. So I find it interesting how Ferris Bueller's Day Off focuses on the class divide, but between sort of upper middle class and really, really rich. Yeah, 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 for um, sure. And that sort of feels like wealth as a, sort of proxy for structure versus agency. Yes. Um, yes. Which I only found out or you know, learned about as terms reading Girls Will Be Girls by Ema O'Toole. So mm -hmm. Very good. Awesome, awesome <laughs> book. Go read. Um, <laughs> what films should I have watched to talk about structure versus agency? I mean, the most, so for me, the most obvious film about class is actually slightly earlier John Hughes film, which is Pretty in Pink, um, which is very much about working class kids versus the rich kids. Um, John Hughes himself was lower middle class and he grew up in an upper middle class neighborhood in the suburbs of Illinois. So he was always very self-conscious about class differences. And in his movie, the rich kids are always kind of evil and the poor kids are noble. Um, but the rich kids get everything and the poor kids have to struggle. Um, and when he made Ferris Bueller, he kind of recreated that, but made, made so Pretty in Pink, there's a the character Ducky, played by John Cryer, who is very working class, sleeps on apparently a mattress on the floor, and, and seems to not have any parents. Um, and he is up against the horrible rich kids in school, played by <laughs> James Spader, ultimate crush, um, who is this kind of awful, drugs-taking, obnoxious guy called Steph, for some reason. All characters in John Hughes movies have really weird names. I, one day I want to do a dissertation, I want to go back to school and do a PhD dissertation <laughs> on the kids, uh, names, ki names of kids in John Hughes' movies. Anyway, so there's Steph. So anyway, Ducky is, kind, is unpopular because basically he's poor. Like that's kind of what Pretty in Pink is saying. And the same for Molly Ringwald's character, Andy. She's unpopular because she's poor. Uh, she literally lives on the wrong side of the train tracks. They have her living next to a train, for God's sake. So when he came to write Ferris Bueller, he sort of rewrote Ducky, but as a fantasy. And he got Matthew Broderick to play the character of Ferris. And Matthew Broderick and John Cryer, as teenagers, look basically identical. It's Particularly kind of in, the, uh, in the parade scene. Exactly. I mean, the, the he, with the quip. The I mean, yeah. he's basically Ducky. Um, but he made Ferris Bueller upper middle class. Um, and lives in this big house. And he made him exactly like Ducky. He likes weird British bands. He wears weird two-tone shoes. He knows about tech. He's quite annoying, but everyone loves him. And Those aren't related, by the way, knowing <laughs> about tech and being <laughs> Wrong. Read the room, Freeman. Um, <laughs> um, and um, 
and, but they make him really popular, and everyone in the town loves him. And so it's kind of Ducky slash John Hughes's fantasy of what he could have been like, what life could have been like if he'd been rich. And he could have skipped school and gotten away with everything. If he stayed off from school sick, there'd be banners in the sky saying, get well soon. All that kind of stuff is a real teenager's fantasy of popularity. And for John Hughes, popularity and wealth were synonymous. Um, I think it is interesting when British people see American movies that show social class divides because British poverty and American poverty in a lot of ways are really different. Uh, a really interesting sort of illustration of that for me was when I went to see Blue Valentine a few years ago in this country with some friends. Uh, Blue Valentine, uh, starring Michelle Williams or Ryan Gosling, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. I mean, they're supposed to be quite poor in that movie. I mean, that's part of the movie is they're struggling with money. But they always have massive cars. And I didn't even notice this when I saw it. And I came out, my, my best friend who's British was like, they're so poor, why are they driving these massive four by fours? I was like, oh, he's, see, in America, obviously, there's a whole thing about American, like, basically, I don't even know what they call it now. It's kind of leasing cars. And in American suburbs, everybody has these massive cars that they lease, and they're going poor. And that's not saying British poverty and American poverty, like American, you know, I don't know. It's not like American people aren't poor, British people aren't poor. It's just a different attitude. So a lot of times in these American movies, I feel like British people see the people with massive cars and think, oh, they're not really poor. And actually, it's a whole different kind of weird poverty system in America. But anyway, that's a different, <laughs> different thing. But also the big houses in these movies, that's another oh, yeah. thing that that I find British people find really weirded out by, particularly the suburban houses in John Hughes's movies. Like, you look at the house in, in Home Alone. I mean, that house is like as big, it seems like as big as the White House. I mean, that <laughs> house is freaking massive. Um, but the truth is, in the suburbs, um, they are probably very expensive now, but there are a lot of bigger houses that don't necessarily denote massive wealth that they would especially here in the countryside. I right. mean, you can get these big houses in the suburbs thing <laughs> that, don't, that don't require you to be a billionaire. Brilliant. We, I could chat with you all day, but unfortunately we are running out of time. Does anyone have one final question for Hadley? I've got to go back and write a column about Ben Affleck, so please, by all means, <laughs> fill my day with questions about these movies. Anything's better than, than Baffleck. <laughs> okay, well, in that case, just remains for me to say thank you so much. This has been a complete treat, and all of you who haven't read the book yet, have a treat in store and do book next week off because you will want to just spend the whole time <laughs> watching films. I, say anything, I, go home and watch Say Anything. Like, yeah, I feel well, like this, I'm like an evangelical It's certainly going to be on my list. Um, <laughs> I spent uh, a happy, very happy plane journey having just finished the book for the second time, watching I think four of the movies in here on one plane oh, journey. Amazing. It was awesome. Um, so thank you ever so much, Hudley, and uh, yeah. Thank you for Brilliant. having me. Thank you. Thank you.